Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to a series of videos in which I am reading you a book. I am reading you Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope. This is in the way of a follow-up to a, re a read-aloud series of videos that I did last year with Micah Cummins and Mark from Book Time with Elvis, where we read you The Warden, the first book in this series, which tells the story of a gentleman named Mr. Harding, who is the warden of a charitable hospital for 12 beadsmen, 12 old men, made by the will of a man centuries ago named John Hiram. And in the time that that hospital had been running, the land on which it had been established uh, had grown more valuable. And as a result, the warden of Hiram's hospital was drawing an enormous annual salary. Uh, the beadsmen, the 12 old men, they had nothing. No one, no family, no jobs, no nothing. So they were getting a tiny dispensation a week and free room and board in a lovely setting. But they weren't sharing in the profits of that hospital. And a newcomer to town, Mr. Bold, thought that was an injustice and decided to take it to the newspapers and make a big deal out of it and examine the will and see if something could be done. And this was horrifying to Mr. Harding, not because he was greedy or because he was proud and didn't want to lose his position, but because he didn't want to be thrust into the limelight and be talked about in the letters page of the newspaper, the Jupiter. And so he resigned to resolve, to, to re he resolved to resign from the hospital. And there was much to and fro. If you listen to that read along, then you will know. And I am now reading you Barchester Towers alone because my personal body odor has driven both Mark and Micah off booktube. <laughs> what can you do? And please don't say bathe. <laughs> anyway, uh, in this, this second book in the series, Parliament looks at the state of affairs of the hospital and decides to reestablish it with a warden to reestablish to establish a home for beads women with a matron that will oversee it and uh, to finance the whole thing. So naturally, the new bishop at Barchester, a uh, Mr. Prouty, who whose imperious bossy wife and whose oily chaplain, Mr. Slope, have made it their mission to control the ecclesiastical world of Barchester, against the wishes of everyone involved. Uh, the bishop decides that for goodwill, of course, he will reappoint Mr. Harding, who is beloved by all and who has held the position forever and ever. There'll be less money, but that's just an act of parliament. There's nothing that Mr. That Mr. That Dr. Prouty can do about it. He intends, as we learned a couple of chapters ago, to reinstate Mr. Harding. But... His chaplain, Mr. Slope, has certain conditions. He has changes in mind. Uh, and that's where we find ourselves in this new chapter. In the last chapter, uh, Mr. Harding was summoned to Mr. Slope for a meeting, and Mr. Slope told him about those changes, that Hiram's Hospital would become a preaching house, that there would be sermons preached there and a Sunday school for the children of the neighborhood and whatnot. Uh, and he senses right away in the course of the conversation that Mr. Harding is not with him in this. Mr. Harding is the gentlest of souls, doesn't want to argue. But Slope senses right away that Harding is not convinced that, of the necessity of these changes and makes rude comments about how changes are sweeping the land and people that don't accommodate to those changes will be tossed out on the rubbish heap. Uh, Mr. Harding does not accept the position. He doesn't deny it right there in that conversation, but he doesn't accept it. He says that he will confer with friends of his, mostly meeting the Archdeacon, Dr. Grantley, who deadly opposes Mr. Slope and his reforms. But Mr. Slope sees it as uh, Harding refusing the position. And that's how we leave that chapter. Instead of following Mr. Slope, we the next chapter follows Mr. Harding. This is chapter 13, and it is called The Rubbish Card. Mr. Harding was not a happy man as he walked down the palace pathway and stepped out into the close. His preferment and pleasant house were a second time gone from him, but that he could endure. He had been schooled and insulted by a man young enough to be his son, but that he could put up with. He could even draw from the very injuries which had been inflicted on him some of that consolation which we may believe martyrs always receive from the injustices of their own sufferings, and which is generally proportioned in its strength 
to the extent of the cruelty with which the, the martyrs are treated. He had admitted to his daughter that he wanted the comfort of his old home, and yet he could have returned to his own lodgings in High Street, if not with if exaltation, at least with satisfaction, had that been all. But the venom of the chaplain's harangue had worked into his blood and sapped the life of his sweet contentment. Because he can't help, Mr. Harding is such a gentle, sweet, introspective soul, but he can't help but wonder if maybe Mr. Slope is right. How horrible. The reader is sitting there saying, no, you are the soul of goodness. Get these thoughts out of your mind. That is extremely well done on Trollope's part. New men are carrying out new measures and are carting away the useless rubbish of past centuries. This is a quote from Mr. Slope from last time. What cruel words these had been, and how often they, now use, they are now used with all the heartless cruelty of a slope. A man is sufficiently condemned, if only it can be shown, that either in politics or religion he does not belong to some new school established within the last score of years. He may then regard himself as rubbish and expect to be carried away. A man is nothing now unless he has within him a full appreciation of the new era, an era in which it would seem that neither honesty nor truth is very desirable, but in which success is the only touchstone of merit. We must laugh at everything that is established. Let the joke be ever so bad, ever so untrue to the real principle of the joking. Nevertheless, we must laugh, or else beware the cart. We must talk, think, and live up to the spirit of the times, and write up to it too, if that cathcoats be upon us, or else we be not. New men and new measures, long credit and few scruples, great success or wonderful ruin, such are now the tastes of Englishmen who know how to live. Alas, alas. Under such circumstances, Mr. Harding could not but feel that he was an Englishman who did not know how to live. This new doctrine of Mr. Slope and the rubbish cart, new at least at Barchester, sadly disturbed his equanimity. Same thing is going on throughout the whole country. Work is now required from every man who receives wages. These are also quotes from Mr. Slope. And had he been living all his life, receiving wages and doing no work? Had he in truth so lived as to be now in his old age justly reckoned as rubbish, fit only to be hidden away in some huge dust hole? The school of men to whom he professed to belong, the Grantleys, the Gwynns, the old high set of Oxford divines, are afflicted with no such self-accusations as these which troubled Mr. Harding. Entirely true. They, as a rule, are as satisfied with the wisdom and propriety of their own conduct as any can, as can be any Mr. Slope or any Dr. Proudy with his own. But unfortunately for himself, Mr. Harding had little of this self-reliance. When he heard himself designated as rubbish by the slopes of the world, he had no other recourse, or no other resource than to make inquiry within his own bosom as to the truth of the designation. Alas, alas, the evidence seemed generally to go against him. He had professed to himself in the bishop's parlour that in these coming sources of the age of the sorrow of age, and in these fits of sad regret from which the latter years of few, of few reflecting men can be free, religion would suffice to comfort him. Yet religion could not console him for the loss of any worldly good. Or yes, religion could console him for the loss of any worldly good, but was his religion of that active sort which would enable him to so repent of misspent years as to pass those that were left to him in spirit of hope for the future? And such repentance itself, if it not a work of agony, is it not a work of agony and of tears? It is very easy to talk of repentance, but a man has to walk over hot plowshares before he can complete it, to be skinned alive as was St. Bartholomew, to be struck full of arrows as was St. Sebastian, to lie broiling on a gridiron like St. Lawrence. How, if his past life required such repentance as this, had he the energy to go through with it? Of course, it doesn't require that, but he's in an agony of self-doubt. Mr. Harding, after leaving the palace, walked slowly for an hour or so beneath the shady elms of the close, then betook himself to his daughter's house. He had at any rate made up his mind that he would go out to Plumstead to consult Dr. Grantley, and that he would in first instance tell Eleanor what had occurred. Eleanor is his daughter. And now he was doomed to undergo another misery. Mr. Slope had forestalled him at the widow's house. He had called there on the preceding afternoon. He could not, he had said, deny himself the pleasure of telling Mrs. Bold that her father was about to return to the pretty house at Hiram's Hospital. He had been instructed by the bishop to inform Mr. Harding that the appointment would now be made at once. The bishop was, of course, only too happy to be able to be the means of restoring Mr. Harding to the preferment he had so long adorned. 
And then, by degrees, Mr. Slope had introduced the subject of the pretty school, which he had hoped before long to see attached to the hospital. He had quite fascinated Mrs. Bold by his description of this picturesque, useful, and charitable appendage, and she had gone so far as to say that she had no doubt her father would approve, and that she herself would gladly undertake a class. Anyone who had heard the, entirety, the entirely different tone and seen the entirely different manner in which Mr. Slope had spoken of this projected institution to the daughter and to the father could not have failed to own that Mr. Slope was a man of genius. He had said nothing to Mrs. Bold about the hospital's sermon and services, nothing about the exclusion of the old man from the cathedral, nothing about dilapidation and painting, nothing about carrying away rubbish. Eleanor had said to herself that certainly she did not like Mr. Slope personally, but that he was a very active, zealous clergyman, and would no doubt be useful in Barchester. All this paved the way for much additional misery to Mr. Hardy. Eleanor put her happiest face on as she heard her father on the stairs, for she thought she had only to congratulate him. But directly she saw his face, she knew there was but little matter for congratulations. She had seen him with the same weary look of sorrow on one or two occasions before, and remembered it well. She had seen him when he had first read the attack on him in the Jupiter, which had ultimately caused him to resign the hospital. She had seen him also when the archdeacon had persuaded him to remain there against his own sense of propriety and honor. She knew at a glance that his spirit was in deep trouble. Oh, Papa, what is it? said she, putting down her boy to crawl upon the floor. Not she. She's not crawling on the floor. The little baby's crawling on the floor. I came to tell you, my dear, said he, that I am going out to Plumstead. You won't come with me, I suppose. To Plumstead, Papa? Shall you stay there? I suppose I shall tonight. I must consult the Archdeacon about this weary hospital. Ah, me, I wish I had never thought about it again. Why, Papa, what's the matter? I've been with Mr. Slope, my dear, and he isn't the, the pleasantest companion in the world, at least not to me. Eleanor gave a sort of half-blush. But she was wrong in it if she imagined that her father in any way alluded to her acquaintance with Mr. Slope. I think the narrator's wrong. I think Mr. Hardy is relating to that. Well, Papa, he wants to turn the hospital into a Sunday school and a preaching house, and I suppose he will have his way. I do not myself feel adapted to such an establishment, and therefore I suppose I must refuse the appointment. What would be the harm of the school, Papa? The want of a proper schoolmaster, my dear. But that would be supplied, of course. Mr. Slope wishes to supply it by making me his schoolmaster. But as I am hardly fit for such work, I intend to decline. Oh, Papa, Mr. Slope doesn't intend that. He was here yesterday, and what he intends... He was here yesterday, was he? said Mr. Hardy. <laughs> yes, Papa, and talking about the hospital. He was saying how glad he would be, and the bishop too, to see you back there again. And then he spoke about the Sunday school, and to tell the truth, I agree with him. I suppose you would have done so, too. Mr. Slope spoke of a school, not inside the hospital, but just connected to it, of which you would be the patron and visitor. And I thought you would have liked such a school as that, and I promised to look after it and to take a class. And it all seems so very... But, oh, Papa, I should be miserable if I find I have done wrong. No doubt that Mr. Slope did put it that way. That the school wouldn't be in the hospital, it would be connected to it, and that Mr. Harding would be a visitor occasionally, when actually he's going to be an employee. Mr. Slope, here's the catechism you will teach. You're not teaching it well enough. Teach it better. <laughs> uh, nothing wrong at all, my dear, said he, gently, very gently rejecting his daughter's caress. There can be nothing wrong in your wishing to make yourself useful. Indeed, you ought to do so by all means. Every one must now exert himself who would not choose to go to the wall. Poor Mr. Harding thus attempted in his misery to preach the new doctrine to his child. Himself or herself, it's all the same, he continued. You will be quite right, my dear, to do something of this sort. But, well, Papa, I am not quite sure that if I were you that I would select Mr. Slope as my guide. But I never have done so and never shall. It would be very wicked of me to speak evil of him. For, to tell the truth, I know no evil of him. But I am not quite sure that he is honest. That he is not gentlemanlike in his manners, of that I am quite sure. I never thought of taking him as my guide, Papa. As for myself, my dear, continued he, we know the old proverb, it's bad teaching an old dog new tricks. I must decline the Sunday school, and shall therefore probably decline the hospital also. But I will first see your brother-in-law. So he took up his hat, kissed the baby, and withdrew, leaving Eleanor in as low spirits as himself. All this was a great aggra aggra aggravation to his misery. He had so few with whom to sympathize that he could not afford to be cut off from the one whose sympathy was of the most value to him. And yet it seemed probable that this would be the case. 
He did not own to himself that he wished his daughter to hate Mr. Slope, yet he had expressed such a feeling there would have been very little bitterness in the rebuke he would have given her for so uncharitable a state of mind. The fact, however, was that she was on friendly terms with Mr. Slope, that she cons coincided with his views, adhered at once to his plans, and listened with delight to his teaching. Mr. Harding hardly wished his daughter to hate the man, but he would have preferred that to her loving him. Little does he guess what subject is about to be raised to him. Uh, he walked away to the inn in order to order a fly, went home to put his carpet bag, and then started for Plumstead. There was no danger that the archdeacon would fraternize with Mr. Slope, but then he would recommend internecine war, public appeals, loud reproaches, and all the paraphernalia of open battle. Now, that alternative was hardly more to Mr. Harding's taste than the other. When Mr. Harding reached the parsonage, he found the archdeacon was out and would not be home till dinner time. So he began his complaint to his eldest daughter. Mrs. Grantley entertained quite as strong an antagonism to Mr. Slope as did her husband. She was also quite as alive to the necessity of combating the proudy faction, of supporting the old church interests of the clothes, of keeping in her own set such as the loaves and fishes as was duly belonged to it, and was quite as well prepared as her lord to carry on the battle without giving or taking quarter. Not that she was a woman prone to quarreling, or ill-inclined to live at peace with her clerical neighbors, but she felt, as did the archdeacon, that the presence of Mr. Slope in Barchester was an insult, an insult to everyone connected to the late bishop, and that his assumed dominion in the diocese was a spiritual injury to her husband. Hitherto the people had little guessed how bitter Mrs. Grantley could be. She lived on the best of terms with all the rector's wives around her. She'd been popular with all the ladies connected with the clothes. Though much the wealthiest of the ecclesiastical matrons of the, of the county, she had managed her affairs with her carriage and horse as to give umbrage to none. She had never thrown herself among the county, the county grandees so as to excite the envy of other clergymen's wives. She had never talked too loudly of earls and countesses, or boasted that she gave her governess sixty pounds a year, or her cook seventy. Mrs. Grantley had lived the life of a wise, discreet, peacemaking woman, and the people of Barchester were surprised at the amount of military vigor she displayed as general of the feminine Grantleyite forces. Mrs. Grantley soon learnt that her sister Eleanor had promised to assist Mr. Slope in the affairs of the hospital, and it was on this point that her attention soon fixed. How can Eleanor endure him? she said. He is a very crafty man, said her father, and his craft has been successful in making Eleanor think he is a meek, charitable, good clergyman. God forgive me if I'm wrong, but such is not his true character, in my opinion. His true character, indeed, said she, with something approaching the scorn for her father's moderation. I only hope he won't have craft enough to make Eleanor forget herself and her position. Da, da, da. Do you mean marry him? said he, startled out of his usual demeanor by the abruptness and horror of so dreadful a proposition. <laughs> what is there improbable in it? Of course, that, that would be his own object if he thought he had any chance of success. Eleanor has a thousand a year entirely at her own disposal. And what better fortune could have fall to Mr. Slope's lot than the transferring of, of the disposal for such a fortune to himself? But you can't think she likes him, Susan. Why not, said Susan. Why shouldn't she like him? He's just like the sort of man to get on with a woman she, left as she is with no one to look after her. Look after her, said the unhappy father. Don't we look after her? Oh, Papa, how innocent you are. Of course it is to be expected that Eleanor should marry again. I should, not be the, I should be the last to advise her against it, if only she would wait the proper time and then marry at least a gentleman. But you don't really mean to say that you suppose Eleanor has ever thought of marrying Mr. Slope? Why, Mr. Bold has only been dead a year. Eighteen months, said his daughter. But I don't suppose Eleanor has ever thought about it. It is very probable, though, that he has, and that he will try to, and make her do so, and that he will succeed, too, if we don't take care what we are about. This was quite a new phase in the affair to poor Mr. Harding. To have thrust upon him as his son-in-law, as the very husband of his favorite child, the only man in the world he really positively disliked, would be a misfortune which he felt he would not know how to endure patiently. But then, could there be any ground? Uh-oh. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll mark it in the, in the video description. <laughs> I'll mark it in the video description. Uh, so let's see, where do we... To have thrust upon him as his son-in-law, as the husband of his favorite child, the only man in the world whom he really positively disliked, would be a misfortune which he felt he would not know how to endure patiently. But then, could there be any ground for so dreadful a surmise? 
In all worldly matters, he was apt to look upon the opinion of his eldest daughter as one generally sound and trustworthy. In her appreciation of character, of motives, and of probable conduct, both of men and women, she was usually not far wrong. She had early foreseen the marriage of Eleanor to John Bull. She had at a glance deciphered the character of the new bishop and his chaplain. Could it be possible that her present surmise should ever come forth as, as true? But you don't think that she likes him, said Mr. Harding again. Well, Papa, I can't say that I think she dislikes him as she ought to. Why is he visiting there as a confidential friend when he never ought to have been admitted inside the house? Why is it that she speaks to him about your welfare and your position as she's clearly done? At the bishop's party the other night, I saw her talking to him for half an hour at a stretch. I thought Mr. Slope seemed to talk to nobody there but that daughter of Stanhope's, said Mr. Harding, wishing to defend his child. Oh, Mr. Slope is a cleverer man than you think of, Papa, and keeps more than one iron in the fire. To give Eleanor her due, any suspicion as to the slightest inclination on her part towards Mr. Slope was, wrong, was a wrong to her. I simply don't believe the narrator throughout this chapter. I simply don't. When he says that Mr. Harding is, is not reproving his daughter, I think Mr. Harding clearly is. When he says that Eleanor has never had a single thought about, along these lines, I think he's wrong. But anyway, uh, she had no more idea of marrying Mr. Slope than she had of marrying the bishop, and the idea that Mr. Slope would present himself as a suitor had never occurred to her. Indeed, to give her her due again, she had never thought about suitors since her husband's death. But nevertheless, it was true that she had overcome all the repugnance to the man which had so strongly felt for him at the rest of the Grantly faction. She had forgiven him for his sermon. She had forgiven him for his low church tendencies, his Sabbath schools, and puritanical observations. She had forgiven him his pharisaical arrogance, even his greasy face and oily, vulgar manners. Having agreed to overlook such offenses as these, why should she not in time be taught to regard Mr. Slope as a suitor? And as to him, it must also be affirmed that he had hitherto equally innocent of the crimes imputed to him. How had it come to pass that a man whose eyes were generally so widely open to everything around him had not perceived that this young widow was rich as well as beautiful cannot probably now be explained. Because it isn't true, that's why. <laughs> anyway, but as such is the fact, Mr. Slope had ingratiated himself with Mrs. Bold merely as he had done with other ladies in order to strengthen his party in the city. He subsequently amended his error, but it was still it was not till the interview between him and Mr. Harding. It was not till after that interview. And that ends the chapter. So we didn't get, not much happened in this chapter. It's mainly the after effect of the chapter before. Mr. Harding is more or less talking himself into declining the position at the hospital, even though he's wanted it all this time, uh, because it has strings attached and he would clearly be under Mr. Slope's thumb. But it's worse than that, because he's, A, wondering if Mr. Slope's accusations about the sloth of the current clergyman of England might be true, and B, it looks like Mr. Slope has made inroads in his own household with his daughter. Uh, so that by the time he gets to Plumstead Episcopi in order to talk to his, his son-in-law, Archdeacon Grantly, he is confronted with the possibility that it's possible that there'll be a romantic attachment between the two. Just poor Mr. Harding cannot catch a break. We saw that in the first book, in The Warden, and it's certainly shaping up to be true in this book as well. But we'll have to hope for the best. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll finish this chapter for now, and we'll be back next time. And I will see you then. Thank you, Book Two.